Hello, I'm Niels Christensen, editor with Kitco News. Uh, welcome to the Online Minds and Money Online Connect Virtual uh, Mining Conference, Global International Conference. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I just wanted to uh, welcome Peter Groskoff, CEO of Sprott Inc., here to talk about gold, the mining sector, everything that's happened in 2020, and what's what he sees for 2021. Peter, thank you very much for this chat. Oh, good to talk to you again, Nils. It's, it's it's always it's always nice. It's been a while since we've talked, so it's nice to yes, uh, yeah. to connect uh, through uh, through minds and money. Um, last time we talked. Uh, you said that uh, gold is a must own. You were actually looking for, you were call, you, you called uh, gold's top. We talked just before the August highs. Um, and I'm sort of wondering, you know, we've seen news come out, potential vaccines, a uh, lot of hope that the global economy can get back to normal in 2021. Has anything changed for you uh, when it comes to investing in gold? Actually, Nils, not much. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll start with your first um, point there, which is that we're getting vaccines and, and a potential return to normalization now uh, sometime next year. Um, that's all well and good. And, and you know, thankfully, we, we, we can all look forward to that and think it's a, a good thing for the economy and, and many other things. But the arguments for gold are different. And um, as we said, coming into the pandemic, the issues are debt to GDP levels, debt which can never be repaid through conventional means, um, total money supply growth that's required to fund the various stimulus pro uh, programs that are required to keep the economy moving. And um, the uh, requirement as well for low or negative real interest rates. So those um, ingredients, if you will, have not changed at all. Uh, what has changed is the pace at which they've, they've been um, exploding off the top right hand side of the page. So when the pandemic started, it was just wham, you know, you, you needed this tremendous um, trillions of global stimulus that, um, and money supply that needed to be printed all at the same time. Of course, it created this cascading effect into gold. And there was a lot of fear as well. So the fear subsiding, the pace of change has perhaps ebbed a bit, but the underlying ingredients have not changed at all. In fact, they've just gotten worse. There's more need for gold now than there was prior to. And I would say the other story for gold is it's not a fringe asset. It's being accumulated, as we talked about earlier this year, as a must-have asset. And that kind of 3% allocation from the world's largest investors, 3 to 5%, that's actually happening. It's, the volumes are there. So that's our story. It's broad. I think that's the story of the sector, is the accumulation as a must-have asset is really just in its infancy. Wow, um, that's <laughs> it's it's nice to see this bullish attitude, especially what we saw through uh, November. Um, you know, one of the worst months uh, for gold in in four years. But you actually called that a healthy well. correction, Nils. So a healthy it, yeah, corrections need to happen. Steam needs to get blown off. Markets get overextended. Uh, people need to take profits. Uh, people need collateral for other investments. So gold is you know. It's a huge market. It, it needs to move in these in these cycles. So, I think it's quite healthy. Um, okay, so uh, healthy. Uh, on on that note, 2020, 2020 was a big year. All time highs in August. We have okay. seen this, you know, healthy correction as you call it. Uh, what's in store for gold in twenty twenty one? I mean, obviously, you know, as you say, it's it's a must need asset. Um, not necessarily, you know, hold you to any forecast, but I mean, where do you see gold next year? I think it's a slower and steadier increase into the, into the 2000 range again. And I think it's a function of what happens with the U S dollar. Obviously the U S dollar is quite weak right now, looking like it's going to break down. It's a function of stimulus. It's a function of rates. And, you know, and it's also very much a function of other markets. Are other markets healthy? 
because if they are, people don't think they need gold as an insurance asset as much. Whereas if you get corrections in other markets, which I think the likelihood of that is quite high, you know, gold becomes again, you know, one of the, the you know, assets that's really being clamored for. So it's, it's a function of all those things as to how fast it happens, but we, we are calling for increases next year. Um, and what do you think is sort of the biggest driver? I mean, you, you, you mentioned, you mentioned a, a few right there, but I'm sort of wondering, I mean, a lot of people are talking about inflation, uh, stimulus measures, like you say, you know, uncontrolled spending, uh, you know, really the only way to do this is to, to, to deal with these budgets and, and deficits is through inflation. It is through currency debasement. Do you think this is the, the factor that people are going to watch uh, for uh, next year? Um, no, I don't. Um, you, you, you have hit a key. Purchasing power or currency debasement is um, you know, the, the key long-term theme for gold. It's, it's the, the key driver of why you need to own it. But purchasing power debasement doesn't necessarily show up in inflation. Those numbers pick up every day. Budgetary items, you know, they're managed by the government. I don't think they're that accurate. And, and you've already seen massive asset inflation. Okay. And um, I think that, um, uh, you know, commodity inflation is a, already started to take hold in many areas. But when does that come through in the actual inflation statistics? I mean, there's still a lot of slack in the economy still some slack in the labor markets. I wouldn't expect broad government calculated inflation to hit in 2021. That's not part of our forecast. Mm -hmm. However, sneaking purchasing power debasement is occurring every year and has occurred every year for the last 40 years. So I think that's going to just accelerate. I think assets are going to get you know, more expensive while currency is going to lose some of its purchasing power. And you say, you know, like you need to hold gold as a hedge against, you know, like equity valuations, you know, the Dow hitting, hitting above 30,000. Um, that just means like, how do you, how do you protect yourself if there's a correction? How do you have tail risk insurance? I mean, there's not a lot of ways you can buy equity puts, you can, you can hold money in government bonds, but they have risk too now. Um, so I think gold is ultimately the best hedge there is. Um, interesting. So we got uh, a question from uh, one of uh, um, one of our viewers, uh, and it's sure. quite timely. Uh, what do you think uh, gold does in a pro in a uh, Biden presidency? I mean, you know, do we see lower um, safe haven demand for gold as sort of you know normality returns to uh, normalcy returns to the market? Well, convention right now is that a Biden presidency will be good for gold because of the amount of stimulus and um, and the required monetary accommodation for that stimulus, um, monetary fiscal stimulus as, as well. And um, I, I think that's probably true. Um, but really, you know, does it matter anymore what the presidency is? I mean, they, they need to, to, to keep the stimulus going. The mathematical equation doesn't work without it. I, I don't think there's a lot of ammunition left in anyone's coffers right now to change the course of what's got to happen, which is financial repression. Mm -hmm. Well, I was I, one that I heard of uh, last week actually is that you know come just after Christmas, 12 million U.S. Americans could lose their um, uh, unemployment benefits. You know, so it, it's expected mm -hmm. to run mm -hmm. out by December 26th. Yeah. And like, just, you know, like even if a vaccine, like if a vaccine comes, like these people are not getting back to work, you know, before the springtime. So like what, you know, like how much money is going to be needed to support these, these 12 million people? Well, I certainly can't answer that. All I know is the answer is more. It, it's <laughs> just going to, it's just going to keep rolling around the globe. Um, not just in the U S and Canada, we have similar issues. You know, government's talking about spending an additional hundred billion. They don't have. Um, you know, it's similar in almost every um, in almost every economy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, big year for twenty twenty has been a big year for for gold, and you see more upside next year. Let's take a look at the mining sector. They've also had uh, well, I mean, they've had an amazing third quarter. Um, 
you know, there and and just and you just have to look at at what Sprott has done. Third quarter, um, amazing earnings. You noted that uh, Sprott's assets under management so far this year has grown seventy six percent. You know, it does this does this pace continue for in into twenty twenty one? Well, I think we will continue to grow in, in 2021. As I said, this uh, process of getting larger investors that have never really had gold as part of their portfolios before invested in the sector, that's our main business. And I, that, that's going to continue. We're in growth mode here. No question about it in my, my mind. But is it 76%? That would be a hard performance to repeat. Um, I'm personally hopeful that some of that growth that we saw in bullion will swing into the equities next year because the equity management, the sector specific equity management in gold has not really changed in years. It, it hasn't lost, but it hasn't really gained. People have been nervous to commit to the equities as a sector specific strategy. And we think the time for that is right now. So we're going to do our best to, uh, to drive some equity inflows. What, what do you think is needed to, to get that equity? Because I, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, you look at what mining companies did in the third quarter, and then you look at their valuations. Uh, you know, they're way below what they were last time gold hit yes. all time highs. Yeah. Um, what brings investors back to the mining sector? Well, I think that the, the the, the understanding that the mining sector is really right now entering a, a renaissance type of phase where it's not just um, gold that's performed well. And the mining companies themselves have very much got their house in order. I mean, they're being better run. Um, they're being run, you know, from a more disciplined standpoint for, for, for shareholders, returning capital to shareholders. And I think it's this um, combination of having a great commodity price, but also well-run companies um, that are now producing record amounts of cash flow and are also able to take projects that were difficult under lower commodity prices and say, we're going to earn a 50% EBITDA margin from this project. I mean, it, it is, they are gushing cash and they're able to, um, to grow from the ground up now. So I think uh, when people see those dividends, see that dividend growth, see those earnings, see the cash flow growth, um, you'll have to have it as part a, a greater part of your portfolio because it's it's going to outperform the S and P. Well, yeah, where where else do you go for for dividend growth? I mean, you know, mining companies are offering some of the best dividends in the market right now for not just for mining companies, but just for general equities. Right. And as you said, it's they're far cheaper than any time on that basis, any time in their history. Mm -hmm. So what do you, you know, looking at margins, looking at this cash flow, you know, their mining companies are just making big bundles of, of, of bags of cash right now. The question I think a lot of people are asking is, have they learned their lessons from you know, the last bull market. I mean, I think a lot of investors got burned when, you know, margin, they, they just, they blew out their balance sheets um, on, you know, they chase projects. Yeah, they, yeah, absolutely. You know, have they, have they learned or, you know, like, are we, are we setting ourselves up with so much money in the system that that just chases bad products? You know, like, you know, a lot of projects look good at $2,000 gold, but that doesn't necessarily mean they should be built. Right. Well, it's a volatile sector. You're always going to get hot money moving in and out and you're always going to have some degree of excess. However, the bulk of the sector now is managed completely differently than I've seen it managed in the past. I think these are professional teams. Um, they're taking their budgeting processes much more seriously. They're taking their shareholder governance much more seriously, including returns of capital to shareholders. The CEOs are much more disciplined, much more, um, I think cognizant of not making mistakes and keeping a, a good thing going while they can. So I, I think it's a completely different time now where you've had this intersection of a great industry um, situation with great and much improved management. 
Wow. Um, we have a couple more questions from our audience. Um, this one's really interesting. Uh, when Sprott invests in a mining company, how active are you, you know, when it comes to board decisions and stuff like that? Well, we, we, everything in its own place. So mostly we try and pick companies that are already well run and um, hopefully we can just enjoy as passive shareholders, uh, their growth and performance. However, when we have a big stake and things are not being done exactly as we would uh, like, we have no issue rolling our sleeves up and getting involved. That's usually from behind the bench as a kind of uh, supporting cast member for CEOs, but when change is needed, we'll push for change. But I was going to say, you don't really consider yourself uh, active uh, uh, investors, as it were. We have have the cape of activist investors. We have the capability to go uh, and and follow an activist strategy, but that is not our preference. That is not our business plan. And and nor do we think that's anything but a last resort. Mm -hmm. Um, Another interesting question, and I think very timely, um, ESG is becoming a bigger discussion in, in yeah. the mining sector. Um, how does that, how does ESG uh, fit your investment criteria? So it's very much a part of it now. You know, everybody says, oh, well, we've discovered ESG and turned over a new leaf and everything. That's not at all true with mining because in mining, you know, starting in the 1990s, that was an industry that was squarely in the target of every government, every community in terms of getting its act together. So this has been something, you know, I would call it sustainable development practices have been, you know, being developed in the mining business for 30 years. ESG is more for us about, okay, let's really weed out the bad eggs. Let's not invest in companies that are doing things in a certain way, no matter how attractive they might be. And um, let's have an official policy about that and report on that policy. So it's about making it official. It's about, you know, completely closing the door to companies that, you know, are are in one way or another not there yet. And it's about reporting it and having it run through all our funds. Um, This has been a fantastic conversation, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, for okay. your time. We, I think we have time for one last question, and that's M&A. Last time you were on Minds yeah. and Money, yeah. you were saying that uh, you were expecting 2021 to be a big year for M&A. You know, everything sort of got pushed back because of the pandemic. What's your view on M&A uh, for next year? All right, I'm going on the record on this one, Nils. <laughs> 2021 is going to be a record for a year for M&A in the mining sector. And here's the reason. We've had a bottleneck due to COVID. We've had CEO discipline and and board discipline in terms of, you know, looking at uh, very, very carefully at at these deals before they're made. But you can't change the math. The seniors need reserve growth. They need production growth. The juniors are trading at less than half their multiple. You can't change that math. The only thing that's going to change it, there's going to be deals. And there's going to be deals so companies get bigger and better and more efficient, not because you know, everybody needs to do a deal, you know, tomorrow. So I think it's going to be a record year for M&A. So do you like, in that vein, do you like the junior sector? Does that have the most potential? I mean, and because part of it is like, we've seen a lot of money flow into exploration uh, early on uh, in this year. So I'm sort of wondering, I mean, does that continue or, you know, where, where's the Well, the, the, you know, the ex- exploration pendulum and the development pendulum swung so hard this year that actually it was looking almost relatively overvalued for a while. Now as well, the mid caps have pulled back 20%. So I would argue um, apples to apples. They're both pretty attractive right now. Um, I think you got to get in front of the, the catalyst situations and take a great development project trading at half of NAV and buy that. And I think you have to buy the well-run intermediate companies because they're cheap as well. I was going to say, do you think that that's the activity is the mid tiers buying the juniors or is it, you know, the, the large cap buying the juniors? I think it's going to come in every way. I think it's going to be large cap to large cap, mid cap to mid cap and, you know, vertical deals for um, to take advantage of valuation inefficiencies. So in that vein, do you think uh, CEOs can, can be disciplined? You know, like, like you say, you know, record year for M&A, you're, you're on the record now. Can, can CEOs stay disciplined? 
I, I, I think they can. And it's because the governance policies have changed. The compensation policies have changed. Um, those CEOs are going to be immediately affected if they've done a bad deal. So um, I think that, you know, the, the, the bar is much higher now. Um, yeah, this is, I, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, the, unfortunately the pandemic sort of put a halt on things. I think, how do you, how do you do deals when you can't see the property? So yeah, that's it's, tough. Yeah, it's it, it, you know, what, yeah. So it has to come. And like you say, there's the, been a the bottleneck. math is there. There's been a bottleneck, you, you know, you need government approvals, you need license approvals, you need community engagement. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of stakeholders that need to be consulted on potential takeovers and they take a long time. It's not mm -hmm. the quick deal doing that existed, you know, in in the early days and maybe that's a good thing. So there's been a bottleneck and I think it gets unleashed in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, this has been fantastic conversation. Thank you very much for joining us here at uh, Minds and Money. Thank you to our audience for listening and for the questions.